Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. So we have a very creepy case to cover today and that is the case of Sam Shelton. Sam Shelton was a 26 year old gym teacher and he worked at a high school in Illinois and he was apparently one of those teachers that every girl had a crush on, which um, given what he goes on to do, really, really, really creeps me out. Well, I'd give her like a hug goodbye. How would you do that? I, that's not sexual, is it? You give it someone because whilst he was working as a teacher, he started a relationship with a 17 year old girl called Ashley Reeves. And I really shouldn't call it a relationship, should I? Because uh, it's grooming. And Sam taught Ashley when she was in middle school. Like they first met when she was only 12 years old. And things started not going Sam's way. And he acted out in a absolutely horrific way that ended in such tragedy. She kind of started becoming obsessed with me. Because like I said, she was calling me not like literally nonstop at times. So that is the case we are talking about today. The creepy gym teacher, Sam Shelton. So let's dive in. I I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor and that is Magellan TV. So you guys know by now how much I love Magellan TV. It is a documentary streaming service that literally has one of the largest collections of true crime documentaries. Now, one of the documentaries that I have been loving on Magellan TV recently is Holloway Women Behind Bars. Now, if you've never heard of Holloway Prison, it is one of the UK's most infamous prisons. It is also the largest female prison in Western Europe. And Holloway Prison is in London and it has been around for like forever. I mean, it hasn't. It was opened in the 1800s and it is packed full of true crime history. Over the years, Holloway Prison has been home to some of the most infamous female killers from the UK, including some of the UK's most infamous baby serial killers, Amelia Dyer, Amelia Slack and Annie Walters. In the early 1900s, it also housed a lot of the suffragettes. Holloway Prison also staged the execution of the last woman to be executed in the UK, Ruth Ellis. And in more recent times, Holloway Prison has also been home to some of the most infamous female killers from the modern times, like Maxine Carr, Joanne Dennehy, Rose West, and Myra Hinley. And you guys know how much I dislike those four women. And it also turns out that whilst Myra Hinley was at Holloway, she attempted one of the most audacious prison escapes that the prison has ever seen. And she was assisted by a female prison officer named Pat, who she had recently started up a romantic relationship with. So there is a lot that has happened at Holloway Prison. I think that is an understatement. The documentary takes you through all of the crazy history and the documentary was absolutely amazing. I know you guys are going to love it. And I personally find prison documentaries so fascinating, especially when they are the more infamous prisons and they hold so much history. But best of all, Magellan TV are offering every single one of you guys a free one month trial, which is absolutely incredible. And if you guys wanted to take advantage of that incredible offer, then go to the link in my description box, which is try.magellantv.com forward slash Danielle Kirsty. And by using that link, it really does help out this channel. So go click on that link, get your free one month trial of Magellan TV, and then you can start watching Holloway Women Behind Bars right now. Oh, and just saying, Magellan TV makes an amazing holiday gift for any documentary lovers in your life. So thank you again to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video, but thank you to every single one of you guys watching right now, because truly, without all of you guys, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And now let's jump into to today's case. Daisy's back. Truly, I feel like I would have Daisy in my background all year round if it wasn't for the reindeer ears. Sam Shelton was born on the 9th of March, 1980, making him a Pisces. And he grew up in Fort Knox in Kentucky, where he lived with his parents, George and Susan, and his older brother, George Jr. Now, to begin with, Sam's childhood was pretty happy. His dad was a US Army major based in Fort Knox. His mom was a stay-at-home 
mom. However, when Sam was just seven months old, his parents started to have trouble in their relationship and it ended in divorce. And it is said that it was a very bitter, horrible divorce. Sam's mom, Susan, moved the two children out of the family home and relocated to Freeburg, Illinois, which is where the rest of today's case takes place. And now she was raising her two young sons alone. She found a job. She was working as an elementary school teacher. And let's just say that Sam's dad, George Sr., was not a good dad. He never paid a penny of child support. But not just that, because that is bad enough. He also cut off his two children. It's like, okay, you've gotten a divorce, but you don't divorce your kids. He never visited them. He never could even be bothered to pick up the phone to phone his children. And he never even sent birthday cards or Christmas cards, nothing. He couldn't even send a card through the post. And Susan was now a single mom and she was struggling because she had to go out and work. She wasn't getting any financial support off her ex-husband. So Susan, she went through the courts. She even wrote a letter to George's commanding officer. And eventually she managed to pressure George into paying child support. So yay, round of applause. He's now paying child support, but he doesn't have anything to do with his children. Like he, he's paying for them, but he doesn't care. He doesn't want any relationship with them. So now Sam had to grow up without a father and he felt like something was just missing from his childhood. When he went to school, he would see all his friends with their fathers. Sam was constantly looking for a father figure in his life. However, Sam grew really close to his mother. And I do think that Sam's mom, she overcompensated for the fact that he didn't have a dad. Sam was also really close to his grandmother, which I can only assume is his mother's mother. So despite not having his dad in his life, he actually did have a really good support system at home and he did really well in school. He really excelled at sports. But apart from that, not much is known about Sam's childhood. What we do know is that when he graduated high school though, he received a scholarship at the McKendry College in Illinois because he was so good at sports. Like he's actually receiving a scholarship. And after a few years at college, Sam decided that he didn't want to be a professional athlete. He actually wanted to be a teacher. He wanted to follow in his mother's footsteps because his mom was an elementary school teacher. And yeah, he just wanted to be a teacher. So he did an extra year at college to get his teaching qualifications. And obviously the fact that he decided to become a teacher is very significant to today's case. And when Sam was 21 years old, he was coming to the end of his degree. He was required to do a year of student teaching in order to get like his teaching qualifications and graduate and eventually become like a proper teacher. So this is when he got a placement at Millstadt middle school. And at the school, he was going to be teaching physical education, which is known as PE in the UK, but you call it gym, don't you, in the US? So he's now a gym teacher or a gym student teacher. And he ended up teaching seventh grade. And there was a 12 year old girl in his class when he was a student teacher. And that 12 year old girl was Ashley Reeves. Ashley Reeves was born in 1989. She was currently living in Milstadt, Illinois, where she lived with her parents, Michael and Michelle, and her younger sister, Casey. So right now, Ashley is currently 12 years old and she's just like every other typical 12 year old. She loves school. She's doing well at school. She has a lot of friends. She is really close to her younger sister, Casey. Casey adored Ashley. Casey really looked up to Ashley and said that she was the best, biggest sister anyone could ask for. Ashley also had a really great relationship with her parents. The family home was happy and peaceful. And when Ashley is 12 years old, she's in the seventh grade attending Milstadt Middle School. This is when she would get a 21 year old new gym teacher by the name of Sam Shelton. Now, I know what you're probably all thinking. Oh my God, she's 12. She is 12. Please, please, please tell me the relationship doesn't start here because obviously I said in the intro that he has an inappropriate relationship with a student, but that is not the case. No, 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 no. Because right now when Sam is Ashley's teacher, when Ashley is only 12, everything is above board. Everything is just a normal 
teacher student relationship. However, Sam does go on to have a very inappropriate relationship with Ashley later on in the case. But not yet. 12 is a bit too young for him. So a year passes. Sam finishes up his role as a student teacher at Ashley's school and he gets his degree. So when he graduated, he actually got a job at an elementary school in St. Louis. He spent a couple of years there. There's nothing really to report about his job there. And then two years later, in 2000, 2004, Sam is now 24 years old. This is when he moved to another school. He actually moved to a high school in Freeburg. And this is when he was going to become a gym teacher at the high school and also teach driver's ed. And Sam remains as a teacher at this high school for the rest of this case. So whilst Sam is working at this high school in Freeburg, it is said that he was a model employee. Literally, he could not put a foot wrong. The students loved him. The other teachers loved him. He was really good at his job. He was young, so he had a lot of energy and he was able to relate to the children a little bit more. He was like that cool teacher. He could keep the children engaged. However, some of the students liked him a little bit too much. And a lot of the uh, girls at the school took a liking to him because he was young. He had a very athletic build. He was very charming, apparently, which is definitely inappropriate as a teacher. And I read that a lot of the girls formed a crush on him. He was like that male teacher that the girls all loved. I find this weird, but I have a reason why I find this very weird. Now, this is a side note. This is just a little personal story. There was a teacher in my high school that was like Sam Shelton. He was a little bit younger. He was very charming and charismatic. I always found him so weird. I stayed away from him. He always gave me the creeps, but a lot of other girls liked him. And I just couldn't see it because I just saw that he was a creep. And it turns out that he was having inappropriate relationships with some of the female students in my school. So I think because of that, because I actually saw this case literally with my own eyes. No, no, I always just find it weird. No, 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 no. So anyway, Sam was one of those teachers that did get a lot of attention off the younger girls in the school, which I know that if that happens to you, you can't help it. But Sam, he enjoyed it. It's almost like he egged it on. He loved all of the attention that he got from children. But outside of school, Sam kept a pretty normal, active social life. He worked out a lot. He was a bit of a gym freak, which is not really surprising considering he is the gym teacher. He also still had a huge passion for sports. And in his spare time, he would play a lot of sports. Like he would play baseball and basketball. And he was also really into line dancing. He would go line dancing every Every single weekend at the Wild Country Club. And again, this actually brings back more memories for me. Wow, this case is bringing back some memories because I used to go line dancing every single week with my nan. <laughs> I literally used to go line dancing when I was 10 years old and I used to go with my nan and I was the only person under 70 years old. <laughs> I used to be line dancing with all of these old grannies and I used to love it. But anyway, enough about me. Bloody hell. But uh, the fact that he likes to go line dancing does come back up in this case in a very, very disturbing way. Sam was also known to be in a lot of relationships. He was definitely a casual dater. He had, quote, a girl in every port. That is actually a quote from his MySpace page. And I think that that just tells you a lot. On top of all of this, Sam had another hobby that was a huge passion of his, and that was wrestling. Sam was actually a part of a professional wrestling club. He would make apparently $50 a match. He got himself in really good shape to be a wrestler. And he was apparently a champion in the local area. And then you know that wrestlers, they always have like, a nickname, like a, a ring name or whatever it's called. Well, guess what Sam's was? His name was The Teacher. Ugh. Ugh. No. Ugh. So yeah, he liked to go by The Teacher. He also did have another nickname called Mr. Discipline. Ugh but he preferred the teacher. And he actually did like a photo shoot for his professional wrestling where he wore a cap and gown and was holding an apple because, you know, teacher, apple. But anyway, now we skip forward to February of 2006. Sam Shelton is literally just about to turn 26 years old and he has a chance encounter with an ex-student of his, Ashley 
Reeves. Now, at this point, Ashley was 17 years old. And in the four years since she had last seen Sam, she had obviously left middle school. She was now at high school. She was a junior and she was attending a different high school from the high school that Sam is teaching at. So yeah, they're not at the same schools, but she is still a high school student. And the high schools that they are both at are literally just in the next town from one another. So they are very close. And at this point in Ashley's life, everything is still like great. She's getting good grades. She still has loads of friends. She's very social. She has a boyfriend. His name is Jeremy and they are so close. They have been dating for about two years at this point since they were about 15. And they were young high school sweethearts. They were absolutely infatuated with one another. And in February of 2006, Ashley and her friends were attending a Mardi Gras festival in St. Louis. And is it St. Louis or St. Louis? I, I just never know which one it is because I swear people say both. And at the festival, Ashley and her friends, they were having a good time laughing and joking and they just so happened to bump into Sam Shelton. Now it's not 100% clear on how they bumped into one another or the interaction that they had. So it is thought that Ashley or some of her friends recognized him when they bumped into him and they just started talking. And at some point in the conversation, Sam realized that Ashley used to be one of his students when he taught at middle school. And at this point, the conversation, it's not weird. However, Sam should have realized he was the adult in this situation. He should have thought, hmm, okay, this conversation maybe is a little bit too friendly. This group of girls, they're only 17 years old. And I also used to teach some of them when they were only 12, when they were in middle school. Maybe this is a little bit weird. Maybe I need to say my goodbyes and move on. But that was not how Sam reacted. He actually started to put the charm on and he started to flirt with Ashley and her friends because that is what he liked. He liked that he was the quote, good looking teacher that all of the girls had a crush on. And when they're talking, Sam realized that Ashley was a keen basketball player and Sam loved playing basketball. So he invited her to come and play a private basketball session with him. Yep, yep, yep. He's uh, 26 or he's about to turn 26. And he has just invited a 17 year old girl who he used to teach in school when she was 12 years old. He has just invited her to a private basketball playing session. No, no, no. And unfortunately, Ashley agreed. So a few days later, Ashley and Sam meet up for their little private basketball session. And it actually was to play basketball. I know where some of your minds have gone. But when they meet up, Sam puts on the charm again. Now, the interactions between Sam and Ashley are not really known. However, we know that he groomed her. And most grooming stories, they start off the same. Sam, he's older, he's the adult, he is in a position of power. There is a power imbalance here because he is a lot older. He's not nine years older than Ashley. So there's already a power imbalance there anyway, but he's also a teacher. He's in a position of authority. So whilst we don't know the exact interactions between Sam and Ashley, I think we can all imagine what it was like. Sam was probably flirting. He was probably complimenting Ashley, making her feel good about herself. And it was from this moment on that Sam just started to groom Ashley. They would meet up time and time again. These private basketball sessions would become more frequent. They would also meet for trips to the mall together. It's basically like they're going on a date. And I don't even think Ashley realized at this point that they were going on dates, but Sam, he 100% knew. And then on top of all of this, they exchanged numbers and Sam would call and message Ashley multiple times a day, every single day. Sam, it seemed, was becoming obsessed with Ashley. And then it wasn't long until Sam convinced Ashley that they were in a romantic relationship. It literally just jumped to that. And he also kept telling Ashley that the most important thing was to keep their relationship secret. And remember, Ashley has a boyfriend. Ashley has a boyfriend, Jeremy, who she's very much in love with. And my heart really just goes out to Ashley in this moment because she really has just found herself at the hands of a groomer. He has completely taken advantage of her. He has completely abused his position of power. And all of a sudden, 
Ashley, she thought that she was just meeting up for actual basketball games. And now she finds herself in a relationship with an adult. Sam wanted Ashley completely to himself. And he started to convince Ashley to keep more and more secrets from Jeremy. He was trying to drive a wedge between them. So Ashley started to spend less and less time with her boyfriend, Jeremy. And whenever Ashley was with her boyfriend, Sam would always be phoning. He would always be messaging. And the worst thing about this is that Jeremy knew about her relationship with Sam, but Jeremy genuinely believed that they were just friends. So the weeks roll by and Sam continues to groom Ashley. Sam at this point is living with his mom and his grandmother and his mom and grandmother are out of the house most of the time. And whenever he had an empty house, he would take Ashley over to his house. And as the weeks roll by, this is when Sam and Ashley's relationship turns intimate. Sam and Ashley have sex together. Sam, the 26 year old high school teacher has had sex with a 17 year old girl who he used to teach. And I don't know how consensual the sex was, but it doesn't matter because Ashley is only 17 years old. And I did look at the age of consent in Illinois and it is 17. So technically Ashley is at the age of consent. However, from my understanding, the age of consent actually rises to 18 if the other person that they are having sex with is in a position of authority and power like a teacher. So from my understanding, the age of consent technically for Ashley in this relationship with Sam is 18. So this is statutory rape. But Sam doesn't care. He is a predator through and through. And do you know how I know this? Well, that is because Sam actually has another teenage girlfriend. Ashley is not the only teenager that he is dating. Now, we don't know any details about the other teenager that he is dating. However, we do know that she is 18 years old. So technically, she is at the age of consent and it's not illegal. But he's still a teacher. She's probably only just turned 18 as well. And this other teenager is from a different school. And you know what? It really wouldn't surprise me if there were more. He did say, if you remember, on his MySpace that he has a girl at every port, when I actually think that he meant a girl in every school. And the relationship with the other teenager actually does come back up in the case in the most disgusting way. And the relationship between Sam and Ashley would now go on for over two months. And it was in secret. However, after approximately two months, something would happen that would make Sam so angry, so filled with rage that he would fly off the handle. And this would all end in tragedy for Ashley. Because we now get to Thursday, the 27th of April, 2006. This day, Ashley woke up like any other day. She woke up, she got ready for school. She sat down for breakfast with her family and she told them that after school, she was actually going for a part-time job interview. And then after the interview, she was going to go and play basketball with her friends. So she wouldn't be back until late. Now, Ashley's parents, they trusted Ashley completely. So they said, okay, no problem. As long as you're back by 10 p.m. And Ashley promised to be back by 10 p.m. So Ashley went to school. Again, everything was normal. She went up to her boyfriend, Jeremy, and asked him if she could borrow his SUV to drive to the job interview. And Jeremy, he didn't need his car that evening. So he was like, yeah, take my car. No problem. So after school, Ashley took Jeremy's car, said goodbye to him, and she drove to her job interview. And then after the interview, she made her way to a basketball court in Ladderman Park, which was just the next town over from where she lived. So not too far from her home. And this is where she was meeting up with her friends to play basketball. But obviously we know she's meeting up with Sam to play basketball. And they met up at this basketball park all the time. However, this meeting was different because Ashley needed to talk to Sam. So the two of them climb into Sam's car. And this is when Ashley starts to say to Sam that she doesn't know how she feels about their relationship anymore. Over the past couple of weeks, she has been very conflicted about their relationship relationship, that she knew that their relationship was wrong. So Ashley wanted to break things off with Sam. Now you would think at this point, Sam being the adult in this situation, and if he genuinely did care about Ashley, which he claimed to do, you would think that he would almost have a light bulb moment and think, yeah, you know what? This is wrong. I shouldn't be having sex with a child. I should just let you go on and live your life, be with your boyfriend and enjoy yourself. And I'll go and date an adult. But was this how Sam reacted? 
No, of course it wasn't. He was absolutely furious that it was Ashley that was trying to take control of the relationship, that she was trying to break up with him. And I think he was also worried about the possible consequences of Ashley leaving the relationship and who she might tell. He was just thinking about himself in that moment. And Sam has to be one of the most self-centered oh, poor me kind of people I've ever come across. Because Sam reacted in the most unhinged way. Because after Ashley tried to break it off with him, Sam wouldn't let her. Because Ashley is currently sat in the passenger seat of the car. Sam is in the driver's seat. And he just lunges at Ashley. And he grabs her by the neck and places her in a chokehold. Now at this point, Ashley is kicking and screaming. She's probably trying to get out of the car. But Sam just keeps squeezing her neck tighter and tighter. And remember that Sam is a professional wrestler. He had probably practiced moves like this over and over again. He is so much stronger than Ashley. Ashley had no chance of being able to escape. But Sam has so much rage coursing through his body. He is just squeezing tighter and tighter until Sam heard a loud popping noise coming from Ashley's neck. It was a huge crunch and it was the sound of Ashley's neck breaking. And at this point, Ashley stopped fighting. She just went completely limp. And just let that sink in. That is how hard he was squeezing Ashley's neck, that he broke her neck. Now in this moment, Sam instantly panicked and he thought that he had killed her right there and then. Ashley had literally just collapsed over in the car seat next to him. She was not moving. She was not talking. She, she was not doing anything. Now in this moment, Sam should have thought, oh no, oh no, what have I just done? I need to call an ambulance. But that is not what he does. He looks around the car to see if anybody witnessed what he just did, which no one did. And this is when he decides that he needs to cover up what he has just done. So instead of checking for a pulse or to see if she's still breathing, Sam immediately jumps to the conclusion that he now needs to dispose of her body. So currently they're at the basketball park and Sam is frequent there. He is known by the local area to play basketball in this basketball park a lot. So he needs to get away from the scene of the crime. So this is when he drives to another park, which is approximately 10 minutes away, which is called Citizens Park. So he gets to this other park and he parks up, no one is around, and he drags Ashley's body to a nearby woodland area by the park. However, at this point, when Sam is dragging Ashley through the woods, Ashley is still showing signs of life. That's right, she has not died. Even though her neck is broken, she is still alive. And again, I feel like at this point, Sam should have thought, oh, so I didn't kill her. Let's take her to the hospital. Let's try and save her. But he didn't think that. He had another opportunity to save her life, but he didn't. He actually thought, well, I need to finish her off then. So again, right there and then in the woods, he started to choke Ashley. He put his hands around her neck and just started choking her. And he was doing this for a few minutes. And the whole time, Ashley was like twitching. And she had foam coming out of her mouth. It was very obvious that she was still still alive. And Sam thought to himself, oh, well, I need to do a better job here. So in order to finish things off completely, Sam removes his belt and he wraps his belt around Ashley's neck and he just starts to squeeze as hard as he could. He pulls that belt tighter and tighter around Ashley's neck and Ashley started to froth at the mouth. Her tongue started protruding out of her mouth. She was making these horrible gurgling noises and she turned like a blue gray color and this next part really annoys me but Sam he didn't want to look at Ashley he didn't want to look at her as he was murdering her so as he is there literally with the belt around her neck squeezing as hard as he can he looks away because he, he, he doesn't want to see the foam coming out of her mouth her tongue protruding he doesn't want to see that oh no it's it's too gross so he looks away and he actually turns Ashley over so she's on her stomach now so her face is down in the ground and he places his belt now around her neck that way, places his knee on the small of her back and again just continues to choke her with his belt, pulling tighter and tighter. And he was pulling the belt with so much force that the belt snapped. 
Again, let that sink in. His belt snapped. And now Sam was convinced that Ashley was dead. So now he wanted to cover up his crime. He wanted to make it look like a stranger had just so happened to come across Ashley in the woods and murdered her. So he covered her body in debris and leaves and just tried to make it look like a stranger attack. And then he abandoned her in the middle of the woods. He went back to his car and he drove off. And Sam thought that he was going to get away with murder. There is no way anyone could link him to Ashley. Their relationship was secret. Also, Sam never went to that park. No one would suspect him. No one saw him. Sam really did think that he was very, very, very intelligent. And the reason why I know he had no remorse about what he has just done was because he went out line dancing after. Yeah, he went out line dancing after the attack on Ashley. He didn't go home. He didn't have a meltdown. He didn't shed any tears. He spent the whole evening dancing away without a care in the world, not caring what he has just done to Ashley. A poor, innocent young girl. He's just there. He's dancing, having fun. But was Sam about to get away with this? Of course not, because he's not actually that intelligent. And there is still one more absolutely massive twist to this case. So later that evening at around 10 p.m., just after Sam had finished his line dancing. This is when Ashley's parents started to wonder where she was because obviously 10 p.m. was her curfew and Ashley wasn't home. Ashley never, ever, ever, ever missed curfew. So they started calling Ashley's phone repeatedly, but she wasn't answering. So they call Jeremy, Ashley's boyfriend, and ask if he's seen her, which Jeremy says no. The last time he had seen her was when he lent her his car. They also started phoning all of Ashley's friends, and then Ashley's friends were trying to get in contact with Ashley, but again, Ashley wasn't answering the phone. Pretty much everyone was trying to get hold of Ashley, but she wasn't answering the phone, which was not like her at all, which meant that something was wrong. So without hesitation, Ashley's mom, Michelle, just knew that something was wrong. So she phoned the police. Now, normally in situations where teenagers go missing, the police normally advise to just wait a couple of hours. Teenagers, they do this. They stay out too late, but most of the time they turn up. However, there was just something about Michelle's tone of voice. She sounded so panicked about her daughter that the police decided that they needed to act quick. So the police go out searching for Ashley and within no time at all, they find Jeremy's car, which obviously Ashley had borrowed. They find Jeremy's car at the basketball park that Ashley was supposed to be playing basketball at. But when they found Jeremy's car, it was quite clear that it had been abandoned. So the police search the local area around the park, but they can't find Ashley. So then we get to the next morning. And at this point, Ashley's parents are going out of their mind. And this is when the police really step up a gear in the investigation and they decide to interview anyone that could be a suspect. And they started with the boyfriend, Jeremy. The police have to start with who is likely to be a suspect. And if someone is in a relationship, their partner is normally the number one suspect. So they bring Jeremy in for questioning. However, Jeremy had a rock solid alibi and the police only needed to talk to Jeremy for like five minutes to realize that he was not involved. How often do you see her? Once a day, usually. Once a day, so I mean, you guys are pretty serious. And yeah, I love her, I love her to death. Anything to get her back. I've I cried, but I mean, I'm just so how tore did, up about how it. Did she... So then they talk to some of Ashley's friends and they decide to focus on the basketball element because obviously that is where she was supposed to be and that is where the car was found. So after the police spoke to Ashley's friends, all of Ashley's friends said, oh, well, she was probably meeting the 26-year-old teacher, Sam Shelton. She always meets up with him to play basketball because it turns out that even though Sam had told Ashley to keep their relationship secret, Ashley Ashley hadn't done a very good job of doing that. And when the police heard this, they were like, okay, this is weird. Why is a teacher, an adult, meeting up for private basketball sessions with a child? He is definitely someone that we need to question. And when the police asked Jeremy about Sam, this is when Jeremy admitted that he knew about Sam. He knew that Ashley had formed a very close relationship with Sam, but Sam was a good guy. He would never do anything to hurt Ashley. Sam, the, uh, the teacher that is a friend of yours, do you suspect anything between Sam and Ashley? No. I, I, I couldn't see it. I mean, 
uh, he I don't think he would ever do anything. So do they play basketball together? They played a couple times that I know of. Do, do they talk quite a bit with each other? Or? Yeah, they talk a lot. A couple times he calls whenever you know I'm around, and which I, like I said, I don't mind. I would say when I'm around, she's probably talking to him maybe two or three times a week. Because a lot of times she does kind of walk off, but I don't question her because you know. It's none of my business, it's, you know, her life. However, Ashley's parents decide to do some investigation of their own. They're not sitting around and waiting for the police, which, to be honest, I don't blame them. So the whole morning, they had been trying to get hold of Ashley's phone records to see who she had been in contact with. And with a stroke of luck, Ashley's phone was in her mom's name. So they were able to get the phone records very easily. So they're going through all of this data, looking at all of the numbers that she had been calling, that had been calling calling her and there was one number that kept popping up over and over again multiple times every single day and they didn't recognize the number the number didn't belong to Jeremy it didn't belong to any of her friends family they didn't know who the number was so they decided to call the number and who did the phone belong to well of course it was Sam Shelton they call up the number and Sam answers the phone he says hi it's Sam here. Who's this? So on the other end, they say, oh, hi, this is Ashley's parents. Do you know where our daughter Ashley is? We can see that you have been phoning her. Who the hell are you? Now, I can imagine that Sam's stomach probably just dropped at this moment and he probably thought, oh my God, they're on to me. But he keeps his cool. And on the phone, he's just like, oh, yes, I do know your daughter. We sometimes meet up to play basketball. But uh, I haven't seen her recently. I don't know where she is or anything. No, I don't know anything. Um, Goodbye. And then he literally hangs up the phone. And I just think, what an idiot. Like, truly, truly, what an idiot. It's like, you attacked Ashley the day before. You have left her abandoned in the woods. And then a random number calls you the next day. Why the hell would you answer? And why the hell would you identify yourself on the phone? Like, what an idiot. Obviously, I am glad that he is an idiot. But still, he's an idiot. So at this point, Ashley's parents did not trust Sam one little bit. He was acting so weird on the phone, plus he had been phoning their daughter so many times. So they call up the police and say that this Sam Shelton needs to be a person of interest. And this was pretty much at the same time when the police had learned about Sam Shelton. The police were like, okay, okay, we need to bring him in. He is a suspect. So Sam, if you're wondering, what he has done because obviously he has just attacked Ashley and left her abandoned in the woods and then he went line dancing. So he went to bed like any other day, slept perfectly fine and then got up the next day and went to work. And remember he works at a high school. He was just going about his life like nothing had happened. So the police go over to the high school and he's actually teaching a lesson and they march him off the baseball field and take him down to the police station for questioning. I'll just state your name for the record. Sam Shelton. So the interview starts and they start grilling Sam about his relationship with Ashley. They start saying, when did you last see her? Why do you always meet up with her? Do you not think that that is a little bit inappropriate? And Sam, of course, he tries to defend himself. He just says that they occasionally meet up to play basketball and it's all innocent. It's just platonic. And then Sam goes on to say that after they play basketball, they occasionally hug goodbye. But he also adds, quote, but a hug isn't sexual, is it? Well, I'd give her like a hug goodbye. How would you do that? I, that's not sexual, is it? You give someone a hug goodbye? Oh my God. I couldn't believe he said that, like truly. Why would you say that? It's like, why would you have to clarify that a hug is not sexual? if it's not sexual. You know what I mean? And the police are like, something's not right here. Like, Trudy, he was giving the police bad vibes. They just could tell that he was keeping stuff from them. So they continue to grill him even further about his relationship with Ashley. And this is when the police reveal that according to Ashley's friends, there is something more intimate going on. And at this point, Sam begins to crack. And uh, he starts to reveal more. So Sam blurts out, okay, there is something more. And he starts off by saying, now, I want you to know this first. We never kissed. I will say this. We never kissed. We, we never kissed. Sam keeps repeatedly saying, we never kissed. We never kissed. That seems to be really important for him to get across, that they never kissed. However, then he goes on to say, but we did have sex once in a vehicle, but we never kissed. Yes, we did have sex in the back of 
in the vehicle there. He never kissed. And I'm like, really? Really? You have just admitted to having sex with a 17 year old when you're our teacher. That's illegal. But you think the fact that just because you never kissed, that makes it okay. What kind of logic is that? And unbelievably, Sam then says that the next day after he had sex with Ashley, he felt really bad about it. He felt so bad. He felt so guilty. And after that day, I felt absolutely terrible about that. Oh my God, this man, he infuriates me so much. You can watch a lot of the interview online. He is literally trying to play the victim when he has just admitted to having sex with a child. And Sam just continues to lie now, like lies are spilling out of his mouth. He thinks, oh my God, how am I going to be able to get away with this? Because he realizes that he has just admitted to having sex with her. This does not look good. And the officers are putting more and more pressure on him and this is when he reveals another bombshell because the police are putting pressure on him about where he was the day prior, the day that Ashley went missing and eventually Sam cracks and he says, okay, okay, I was with her. Sam says that he met up with Ashley at the basketball park and they went to his car to talk because Sam wanted to break things off with Ashley when it was the other way round. So Sam says that he was trying to break it off with Ashley because over the last couple of weeks, Ashley had become obsessed with him. She kind of started becoming obsessed with me because like I said, she was calling me not like literally nonstop at times. Again, it was the other way round. He tries to paint Ashley as this clingy teenager, that it was all her fault, that he didn't want the relationship. It was her that was the driving force behind this relationship. So then the rest of Sam's story is that when he broke it off with Ashley, they started to drive off, but Ashley was going crazy. She was kicking and screaming. She was not happy about the breakup. So Sam pulls over and he orders Ashley out of the car. So Ashley gets out of the car and then Sam drives off, leaving Ashley alive at the side of the road. She was screaming, kicking, everything, put her down, shut the door, ran the car, I took off, I left her. I left her there, is what I did. I left her out there by Radio Range Road. I left her right out there. So then the officer asked him, so you just left her there at the side of the road? You didn't go back and check on her? I mean, she's only a teenager and you just left her at the side of the road. You didn't go back? And this is when Sam said, no, he didn't go back to check on her because he has a weak stomach. He actually said that he can't cope with horror movies and he didn't want to drive back to check on her just in case she had been run over and she was lying at the side of the road or in the middle of the road. His stomach was just too weak and he wouldn't be able to cope with it. I did not want to drive by there because if I would have drove by there and if I would have seen, if I would have seen her like, I don't know, if she got hit by a car or something and she was laying over there in a ditch, if I would have seen that, I could not stand that. I mean, I, I have an absolute fear. I have a very weak stomach when it comes to like, like gore movies. I can't even watch those. I still have in my head from the uh, that new Texas Chainsaw Master that came out of it. Have you seen that movie? If I would like see her like laying on the side of the road right there, it just, I don't know. I, I would I would have felt absolutely like horrible. I would not be able to keep my calm in an interview like that. If I was interviewing someone like Sam, I would be flying off the handle. Like truly, I would not be able to keep my composure because it's like, oh, you have a weak stomach. Oh, this must be so hard for you. Also, I found it really weird that he just jumped to the conclusion that she may have been hit by a car. Again, who says this? So once again, Sam is lying through his teeth completely. He's trying to stay somewhat close to the truth, i.e. their argument in the car and the fact that they tried to break up. He's trying to stay a tiny bit close to the truth, hoping that the police will believe him. However, they don't. The police are not stupid. They know that he knows more than what he's letting on. However, when Sam goes on a bathroom break, he just so happens to bump into the lead detective on this case. And it turns out that the lead detective actually knew Sam as a child. And he had taught Sam about law enforcement 
when Sam was in the Boy Scouts. So because he knew Sam, he knew a little bit about his background. He had that little bit of a personal connection. He said to the other officers, let me go and interview him. I, I know him. I think I might be able to get through to him. So the lead detective goes into the interview room and he starts to talk to Sam about the one thing that he thinks will get through to him. And that was his grandma. He starts to say to Sam, what would your grandma think about this? She always taught you to tell the truth, didn't she? Tell us about the mistake that was made, Sam. If I left from here and I went and talked to grandma right now and I laid down this whole story that you're saying, what's grandma going to say? Your grandma's not here. Your mom's not here. Oh, but you know what? In a way they are. Because everything they taught you, all the talks grandma had with you are within you. All of them are. And unfortunately right now, Sam, you ain't telling us the truth. And you need to. You have to. For mom. For grandma. And unbelievably, it worked. Sam actually starts to cry real tears. Not crocodile tears. These are actual tears. Because he does seem to have a soft spot for his mom and his grandma. I just want to go home and I just want to explain to mom and grandma exactly what happened. So the lead detective leaves the room knowing that Sam is on the edge of confessing. So when the detective comes back into the room, Sam is ready to confess. Or should I say, partly confess. He's still lying though to make himself seem as innocent as possible. So he changes his story. He says that after he had tried to break off the relationship, Ashley went crazy. She was not having it. She didn't want to break up. She was kicking and screaming and she started to attack Sam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Ashley. Ashley is the one here that attacked Sam. So he pulls over and Ashley is the one that's being unreasonable here. She's the one kicking and screaming. She's the one attacking him. So Sam has no option but to drag her out of the car in a chokehold. And Sam, not realizing his own strength, accidentally broke Ashley's neck when he had her in a chokehold. It was all an accident. Sam, he He's just clearly way too strong. He can't be blamed for that. I'm obviously being very sarcastic here. And when he realized that he had snapped her neck and that Ashley was quite clearly dead, he then dragged her into a nearby woodland area and covered her body in leaves. I dragged her to a wood area. I tied this thing around the neck to make it look like sword. Choked her out there. And then drove off and went line dancing. Don't forget that. And the detectives ask him, so where is she? Where did you leave her? And Sam very coldly just says, I'd need to show you. She's still out there, Sam. She is. And where's it at? I'd have to show you. And this is now when Sam takes the detectives to where he left Ashley's body. So at this point, it was late into the night the next day after Ashley had gone missing. Sam had been in his police interview for 12 hours at this point. That is how long it took for them to wear him down. And I can't even imagine what Ashley's parents were going through all of that time. They had no clue where their daughter was. No clue if she was alive or dead. So late at night, Sam took the detectives back to Citizens Park, which is obviously where Sam left Ashley. However, Sam couldn't remember exactly where he had left her. And as well, because it was now nighttime, everything looked different. So Sam and the detectives, they go into the woodland area with their flashlights and they are looking around for Ashley, but they cannot find her. They are walking through these woods. They have been doing it for about half an hour at this point and the detectives think that Sam is just playing games. However, this was when the group stumbled across Ashley's body. They saw a figure lying in some debris and leaves and it was quite obvious that it was Ashley. Now, when the detectives saw the body on the floor, their heart just sank because they thought that they were going to find a dead body. Just the sight of her was absolutely heartbreaking. However, the story is not over yet because this is where the man massive twist to this case comes in because the detectives, when they approached Ashley's body, she looked dead. However, under close
closer inspection, they saw that Ashley's chest was rising up and down. She was breathing. She was still alive. It turns out that even though Sam had given it his best effort to murder her, she had survived. And there is actually footage of when the detectives found Ashley on YouTube. Like, I couldn't believe it. You can actually see when they come across Ashley's body and you can see in this footage the state that she is in. Her hands are bent in a very awkward way. She's not moving. Her eyes are open. Her mouth is open. And when you see her eyes, she's not present and she can't talk and it's just horrible to see her in that way and you can also see her skin her skin is so red and that is because she was covered in insects and she had been bitten by so many insects all over her body but ashley had been lying there with a broken neck unable to move unable to talk barely breathing for 30 hours let that sink in 30 hours. Paramedics immediately rushed to her and she was immediately taken into hospital. And Ashley's parents were informed that their daughter had been found alive. So they were over the moon. They couldn't believe it. But then they had the terrible news that their daughter may not survive because she really was in a terrible state. Her chances of survival were so, so low. So now that they have found Ashley, they take Sam back to the station to question him again. And I think the fact that Ashley was still alive shocked him to his core. And this is when Sam revealed that he hadn't just broken her neck. He had also strangled her multiple times with his hands and his belt. I took the belt, I, I pulled, and it turned my head because I, I didn't want to see. I heard, a, I heard like a gurgle. I let go and when I let go, she had spit foam coming out of her mouth. But again, he wanted to stress that all of this was an accident. Yeah, breaking someone's neck was an accident. Strangling someone with your bare hands is also an accident. But then strangling someone with a belt was also an accident. How does he think that anyone is going to buy this? He said that he never meant to hurt her, that after he had broken up with her, she just completely lost it. He just meant to take her out of the car in a chokehold. And then he broke her neck and he panicked and he strangled her to make it look like somebody else had killed her because he was trying to cover up his accident. And it doesn't make sense, does it? No, it doesn't. But the officers don't care that Sam is trying to claim that it was an accident because they arrest him and charge him with attempted murder. But it was still unclear whether Ashley would survive this or not, which would mean that his charge would be put up to murder, not attempted murder. But did Sam care? No. Sam did not care about Ashley whatsoever. He just cared about himself. Because what is just truly shocking is that after Sam is charged with attempted murder, he starts to worry about how he's going to cope in prison. Not whether Ashley will live or die. No, 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 no. He worries about himself. And this is when he asks the officer if he's going to be able to get some contact solution to take out his contacts in prison. And also if he will have his own toothbrush. Am I going to be able to get like my contact solution and take my contacts out and toothbrush? And I don't put, think so. I can't take my contacts out either. But not just that. Not just that. I actually couldn't believe he said this next thing. Bizarrely, he asks if he is going to get a private bathroom in prison like it is some sort of hotel because apparently he can't pee in public. Am I able to get like a little private toilet because I can't pee when there's people <laughs> around because my urinary stress disorder? Yeah, I don't know what's saying. And then Sam also said that he will be miserable if he can't pee. Well, I'll, okay. ta I'll tell them that that's what you want, okay. but I don't know if they'll be able to do that. I'll be, I'll be miserable if I can't pee. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Wow. How do you think Ashley feels? Ashley can't move. She can't talk. She can't eat or drink. She can't swallow. She is basically paralyzed. She can't go to the bathroom either. How do you think she feels? And then back to Ashley because she had a long recovery ahead of her. She was still in hospital and it was soon discovered that her throat had been completely crushed, meaning that she was barely able to get enough oxygen into her body, which was resulted in Ashley suffering multiple traumatic brain injuries. So because of this, Ashley 
in the beginning was completely paralyzed. She was hooked up to life support and her eyes were open, but they were completely unresponsive. Her mouth was open, but she couldn't move it. And doctors were worried that she was completely brain dead and that she would never make a recovery. Her parents never left her bedside, always just hoping and praying that she would make some sort of recovery. And finally, Ashley started showing signs of responsiveness. She started to blink. She started to move her mouth slightly. And she actually started communicating with doctors and her parents. She would blink once for yes and twice for no. And her parents were over the moon because they were worried that they were never going to get their daughter back. But there she was. She was fighting. She was still fighting. And the weeks passed and Ashley just went from strength to strength. And it was a struggle. There were ups and downs because she basically had to learn everything again. She had to learn how to move her body. Her muscles just weren't working properly anymore. So she had to learn how to move. She had to learn how to swallow again, talk, walk. And after two months of being in the hospital, she was finally released to go home. But she still had such a long recovery ahead of her. However, I am very happy to say that Ashley did make a full recovery. This is a survivor story and it is just so incredible. It truly is a miracle. I don't know how Ashley survived a broken neck and then just left out in the elements, completely paralyzed for 30 hours. And then what happened to Sam? Because now that Ashley has made a pretty full recovery and she is able to speak again, detectives go and speak to her to ask her what happened. But Ashley, she can't remember anything about the attack. She can't remember being in the car with Sam. She can't remember the argument. She couldn't remember Sam having her in a chokehold. And she couldn't remember being in the woods for 30 hours. However, something that she does remember is that it was her trying to break off the relationship. And she remembers this because the days leading up to the attack, it was constantly on her mind. She was constantly thinking that she didn't want to be in this so-called relationship with Sam anymore. And she wanted him out of her life. So she could remember that. So because because of this, it became pretty clear to detectives that this is what triggered Sam to attack her. Whether that was him punishing Ashley for breaking up with him or as an attempt to silence her because of their illegal relationship. They don't know which one it is, but it has to be one of those reasons. And unbelievably, Sam was granted bail. He returned back to his mother's house. And do you remember when I said that the other relationship that he was having with another teenager would come back in the store? Well, now it does. Because when Sam is released on bail, he is under house arrest. But he messages his other teenage girlfriend, who's only 18, he messages her on MySpace, telling her that this whole thing with Ashley is a misunderstanding. It's just an accident. And he also asks his other girlfriend to come over to his mother's house so he can see her. I cannot believe it. Cannot believe it. Thankfully, the other teenager, her parents, saw the messages, found out who Sam was, this 26-year-old teacher that had literally just tried to murder another teenager. They found all of this out and they stopped their daughter from going over to him. But oh my god, this is why you can't let people like Sam out on bail. Because he has literally just tried to murder somebody and now he's back at home. Yes, he's under house arrest, but the internet exists. And it's like, why have you allowed him to still have the internet? And then afterwards, Sam is now completely alone. He actually tried tries to take his own life. He took a cocktail of prescription drugs and alcohol and he wrote on his chest, do not resuscitate. Well, his mother found him and paramedics arrived to save his life, which they did. But when they saved his life, Sam lashed out at them. He was throwing punches and he was spitting in their faces. And then when he got to the hospital to recover, he was saying lots of racial slurs to the nurses there. So uh, that just tells you a lot, doesn't it, about who Sam is. And as the trial date was looming closer, Sam was still pleading his innocence, still saying that it was just all an accident. But thankfully, in the end, Sam knew that the evidence was just too overwhelming. So he took a plea deal in order to get a reduced sentence. And Ashley's family and Ashley agreed to also accept this
this plea deal so Ashley didn't have to go through a very painful trial. So Sam Shelton pleaded guilty to attempted first degree murder and he received 20 years in prison. And given that this case took place back in 2006, this means that Sam Shelton will be eligible for parole in 2020. Four, which is literally round the corner. And in 2024, Sam will only be 43 years old. But I want to end this video focusing on Ashley because she is so brave. She's incredibly strong. And thankfully to this very day, she is still happy, healthy, and in good shape. And she's never lost that fighting spirit inside of her. And after a very long recovery, Ashley rebuilt her life. She found herself a job she does volunteer work and she went on to start her own family and she now has two children and I just truly admire Ashley so much and her fighting spirit and I just hope that she is happy because that is what she deserves and I will leave you with a quote from Ashley that she said in the aftermath of this case because I think this is very powerful she said quote don't give up don't ever give up on yourself. There's bigger, better things out there. Just keep fighting. Every day, it's a struggle, but you just got to keep on trudging. And I think that is very relevant to life, really. You just got to keep fighting and keep going and never give up on yourself. So that brings us to the end of today's video. As always, let me know your thoughts, theories, and opinions. And don't forget to leave me your case suggestions in the comments down below, because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video. And I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.